Hey, Lance. Hi, Lance. Hello. How are you all doing today? I'm feeling really inspired and awesome. I'm like, I've been totally enjoying the last two days. It's been great. Well, I appreciate you guys all having me to uh, speak at the event today. Uh, I'm, I'm always inspired just listening to everybody else as well, too. So uh, looking forward to being a part of this. Awesome. Um, so Lance Collins from Partner Energy is a licensed architect and a lead accredited accredited professional and is currently a director at Partner Energy in charge of the sustainability team providing design consulting and project management for projects pursuing green certifications such as LEED, Greenpoint Rated, and others. He has over 20 years of experience in architecture, urban design, and sustainable design consulting. Mr. Collins has led the completion of more than 50 green certified projects, including LEED Platinum and Net Zero projects for new buildings and existing construction for partner energy clients. In addition to his professional experience, Mr. Collins is the president of Southern California chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects on the Home Free Champions Advisory Board for the Healthy Buildings Network, a member of the AIA LA Committee on Affordable Housing, and was the founding co-chair of the U.S. Green Building Council Long Beach Branch. Thank you, Lance. I'm really looking forward to your presentation today on healing communities and the environment through decarbonization. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Let me share my screen here and we can just jump right in. Okay. So, uh, again, thank you guys all for having me here today. You know, uh, we're, I want to talk about this idea of buildings having power. And, you know, we talk as an industry a lot about decarbonization and sort of climate change mitigation and all these different ideas. And, and, and as you as you saw from or you heard from my bio a little bit, you know, I'm a licensed architect. I'm an a urban designer. I'm a sustainability consultant. I'm a, a lot of different things. And so as such, I tend to kind of uh, color outside the lines of any one particular discipline, <laughs> probably a little bit too much. Um, so when we talk about decarbonization in particular, um, I want to go beyond the building envelope and talk about communities as a whole, city making, place making, and, and, and how we can make healthier and safer communities across the board, utilizing a lot of the practices and, and principles of decarbonization. So I'm going to show you guys today kind of a, it's not quite a case study, it's more like a beta test of this idea on a project that we're working on at the moment and, and, and some of the things that we're, you know, uh, going through from the design process and, you know, uh, considerations with the team uh, for, you know, this uh, new project. So really where I wanted to start is sort of the idea of the evolution of the power of buildings. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer that, you know, the built environment can shape the way we, you know, live, the way we understand space, the way we build relationships with people, um, the way obviously it impacts the environment. And, and I think, you know, most commonly you kind of start with the baseline business as usual. We're going to do the bare minimum. We're going to meet code you're not really aware of the impacts of a building uh, has uh, on the environment and has on people. Um, you know, the next tier up from that is what I call sort of the less bad uh, version of things. You know, when you have a green certified project, you're doing some percent better than energy codes or you're reducing your water use by X percent. Um, and, and, and so those are, those are obviously all improvements uh, above the bare minimums, but they're still just kind of less bad versions of the things that we've always been doing. Um, up from there is the do no harm category, where we're talking about net zero buildings, carbon neutral buildings, where we on, on a gross annual basis, uh, on, a, on a net sort of a consumption versus production basis, we are balancing everything out. And that, that's a great, that's a, that's a big accomplishment. You know, we're, we're fortunate enough at Partner Energy to be working on multiple net zero projects right now and, and dozens of LEED and other green certification projects. But the next tier up that I'm really interested in is this idea of buildings that can empower 
and have a positive impact on the community with that buildings that can heal buildings that can be uplifting and and, and i think about it from the perspective of sort of uh, environmental justice and social justice and sustainability and how those all merge together to think about, you know, what can we do in the way we shape our built environment to do more than just be less bad? How can we make a positive impact in the buildings and spaces we create? So again, the, what I'm going to show you guys today is kind of what I'm calling a beta test. This is a project we're kind of just getting started on right now. We've been working on it for a few months here, um, but it's still early on in the kind of conceptual design phase of things. And it's a it's a campus project in Willowbrook, which is an area of South Los Angeles, um, uh, sort of between Compton and South LA, South Central. For those of you who are on the West Coast, um, it's a uh, you know a, a, a all new developments about almost 13 acre site. It's going to be about a thousand plus units of housing, about 40,000 square feet of you know commercial space, retail things like that, um, and then another 100,000 plus square feet of office and research space. And it's really envisioned to be a hub for wellness, uh, education, community, and sustainability. It's a joint development between, you know, an institution and a private developer. Um, our role on the project is a sustainability consultant working with the design architect, the landscape architect, civil engineers, et cetera, you know, kind of crafting what the master plan, what the vision for this project uh, wants to be. And, and you can see here from the site plan, you know, kind of the, the conceptual layout of different spaces from, you know, parking to re a residential office, et cetera, on here. And so with the goals kind of established from the ownership group about sort of wellness and sustainability, we thought a starting point to look at would be, you know, different types of data that will help us understand what are the right key performance indicators that we should be applying to this project to really push how can this development be a positive impact on the community? So, you know, looking at all the basic census tract data, demographics and housing and economics and, and social factors to understand what is the context, what is the characteristics of this community that, that this development is going to exist within. You know, this is a primarily Hispanic and African American community. Um, as you can kind of see here on, on, off of this slide, you know, uh, it is. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, sort of, you know, kind of almost 50-50% between owners and renters. You know, it is a very, you know, underserved, disadvantaged community as far as uh, economics go and, and income levels go, and, and also a community that has kind of a, you know, a higher than at least county average levels of, uh, or I should say lower than county levels of, uh, of education rates. So, you know, thinking about the community of Willowbrook and how do we, you know, again, use this project as something that will be a positive impact going forward. So, you know, the, the second step in the data analytics was really looking, you know, beyond the census numbers and understanding what are some of the environmental considerations we need to be conscious of. And so looking at the environmental justice screening tools, looking at the particulate matter that is in the local community, as you can see, obviously, by the screen, uh, a lot of red, so very high, uh, high levels of particulates in the air. This area is adjacent to a number of freeways and sort of the major um, sort of transportation corridors for uh, trucking and rail coming out of the port of Los Angeles. Um, it's a small area. It's only about 1.7 square miles uh, with, with a population just under 25,000, uh, but it's, it's a heavily trafficked area, people coming in and out of Southern California uh, coming through here. Um, you know, it, it's somewhat walkable, has decent transit opportunities. The Blue Line uh, light rail station is right adjacent to this site. Um, but it, it does also score very poorly from sort of a, a, sh a tree equity perspective as far as a, a available trees and shade uh, are around the site here. So again, these are just kind of different analytical points that we've been looking at to see where do we want to focus our attention. Um, you know, also looked at, you know, the California Healthy Places Index report to understand sort of where does this property fall uh, in, a, in, in consideration or uh, in comparison to other areas. Um, and you can see certainly kind of by the all blue character, it's generally speaking less healthy than, you know, the majority of, uh, of communities in, in California. Uh, and that breaks down to economic and education and transportation and all these other categories. You can see how it scores, uh, which is pretty low, the 24th percentile as far as you know a healthy uh, place goes 
The one thing that Willowbrook does have going for it is that it does have a lot of cultural assets in the area. Uh, Willowbrook, as I mentioned, is sort of directly adjacent to you know, uh, Compton and Watts and, and South LA areas. Uh, so the Watts Towers are not that far away. They're less than a mile away, basically. Um, there are a number of parks that are in the area. Uh, as a historically African-American community, there's a number of historical uh, uh, resources, uh, you know, buildings that were built. So post-war modernist buildings that are all, you know, still very, you know, very attractive and different things. So it does have a pretty decent set of cultural assets in the, in the surrounding community that we also wanted to acknowledge and take advantage of as well, too. So kind of with that different set of data points that we started with on this project, uh, as compared to sort of a traditional, let's just say, you know, green uh, certification project where we're looking at how much energy can we save, how much water can we reduce, uh, you know, how much, uh, how much lower can we make the utility bills, you know, this is a sort of couple of different data points that kind of got us with a, a different foundation for this project. And so that led us to establishing a, a, a new set of key performance indicators that we think will bring power to this development and to the surrounding community. And so the sort of tangent to this is, you know, what are the benefits of decarbonization? And again, you know, my definition of decarbonization is, is outside of the building. It's not just how do we electrify buildings? How do we, uh, you know, remove fossil fuels out of buildings? But, you know, what are we really trying to get at at a community scale, at, at, a, at a social scale? And that's, you know, low, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, lowering average global temperature, managing utility costs and grid inter independence, you know, preserving affordable housing, uh, improved air quality and resiliency. And, and all, in my mind, all of those goals uh, sort of span outside of the building envelope, outside of the property line. And so as, as we're looking at how do we create this development, we, we organize this, these set of key, key performance indicators around the, the sort of umbrella of decarbonization to really focus on programming and how do we create more access how do we build a stronger community and, and provide more con connectivity? Uh, Placemaking, you know, reducing the CO2 emissions related to transportation, reducing vehicle miles traveled, providing more shade. Uh, wellness, reducing respiratory illness, uh, you know, levels, lowering obesity, but by providing healthy, you know, activity opportunities. Uh, looking at resources, uh, reusing existing buildings and infrastructure, uh, you know, getting to a zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, target from an embodied carbon perspective, uh, getting to a zero waste target uh, from an energy perspective, again, zero greenhouse gas emissions from an operational energy perspective, uh, renewable energy, clean energy sources. And, and then last but certainly not least is education. How can this project you know, promote jobs, uh, permanent construction or short-term construction jobs and permanent jobs, and also create generational wealth by increasing, uh, you know, the access to capital, um, you know, improving the area median income by lowering, you know, other expenses that most, uh, you know, a lot of people in the community may be faced with. So, you know, these are the kind of KPIs, aspirational goals, whatever you want to call them that we, that we're using as the organizational principles for this project. And so what does that look like? Um, you know, like I said, this is still early in the conceptual design phase on the project, but we've identified kind of a, a toolkit, if you will, for each one of those KPIs about how we want to see that be uh, uh, integrated into the, into the project design. So certainly, you know, starting from a programming perspective, looking at affordable housing, giving people the opportunity to live near jobs and schools so they're not commuting, you know, an hour, two hours away, which is not uncommon in Southern California to, you know, get cars off the road to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, you know, providing community spaces as part of the program, having a community center and daycare so that families have a support structure around them where they can maybe take on different job opportunities. They can, you know, pursue their own career advancements, et cetera, uh, having that built into the program of the development. Uh, having a medical component being built into the program so people can have access to you know, medical clinics and different opportunities for regular health screens, you know, in, in, particularly in minority communities, communities of color that have been underserved, you have, you know, a, you know, extraordinary high cases of, you know, obesity and diabetes and other health conditions because people don't get the chance to go to the doctor enough. So we wanted to make sure that this was a part of the program that's going to be delivered to this community, not only for this campus, but, you know, for the surrounding context. 
Um, we want to have a cultural art space uh, and to preserve the identity of Willowbrook and South LA and Compton and Watts to make sure that, you know, this new development doesn't become just something that, you know, be, gets kind of thrown in the gentrification bucket. It preserves the identity of the community that has existed there for a long time. Um, we want to have community serving retail to make sure that we are avoiding uh, having a food desert. You know, people can have the opportunity to, you know, get healthy food, groceries, fruits and vegetables, et cetera, you know, within walking distance of where they live and where they work. And, and then, you know, finally providing green space uh, as an opportunity for recreation uh, as a part of this development, as I mentioned, with the sort of low uh, tree equity score that we observe, we want to sort of, you know, uh, uh, write that imbalance by providing more open space for people uh, to play and to enjoy being outdoors. From a from a placemaking perspective, you know, the, the KPIs that we establish are kind of translating into this kind of kit of parts. Uh, number one, having a clean vehicle infrastructure, again, sort of pushing zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, having hydration stations. Well, you might think that that's kind of uh, building specific. It's actually important to have that outside in the public right of way as well, too, so more people can have access to clean water and improved health if they're going to be exercised and they're going to be walking, you know, to the transit stations, things like that. We wanted to make sure people had access to, you know, clean water within the public right of way. Um, having multimodal transit lines, you know, bike lanes, uh, et cetera, to promote healthy transit choices, to promote physical activity, to promote recreation, and again, reducing uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, having safe streets, you know, when you put a development in that has a thousand plus units, you want to make sure kids can walk to school in a safe manner, you know, both physically from, you know, a public right of way perspective, but also, you know, from a, a, a safety uh, and sort of public welfare perspective of, you know, crossing through different neighborhoods and communities that, you know, can often be, you know, uh, unsafe in different parts of South LA. Uh, Access to transit, you know, lower vehicle miles traveled. As I mentioned, the, the Metro Blue Line station is about a quarter mile away from this site. So part of the, part of the project scope includes building out, you know, a, a pedestrian walkway uh, with infrastructure improvements to get direct access to the Blue Line uh, so that people can, you know, go take the train to get to jobs in Long Beach or downtown Los Angeles or other areas. Uh, and then again, open space. This is going to show up all over the place, but open space to pr to promote a lower heat island effect, uh, provide a space for you know improved mental health, and to provide beauty to the project. Um, you know, to no surprise, in many underserved communities, disadvantaged communities, you know, there's just a lack of green space and trees and parks and things like that where people can just go play as kids or you know have a time to you know sit outside and read a book and all those kinds of things. So, you know, beauty is is an important part of of, of this uh, program and this development as well too. Um, the next category, the next set of tools is relative to wellness, and this kind of gets a little bit more building specific, certainly looking at HVAC filtration, uh, as, as we learn from the environmental justice screening tool, you know, the particulate matter adjacent, coming from the adjacent freeways, from the adjacent uh, rail lines and things like that uh, are very high in this neighborhood. So we want to make sure that all of the residences and businesses in the built in the area have high uh, filtration capabilities to screen out all that particulate matter. You know, specify you know standard finishes that are all zero, uh, zero VOC paints uh, to reduce you know uh, exposure to asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Um, you know, having CO two monitors in all spaces, residential and non residential spaces, to make sure we're providing enough outside fresh air to you know alert people if there are any high levels of uh, carbon monoxide or, or carbon dioxide available. Uh, you know, to have that data available to understand you know when improvement is needed. Uh, again, open space to improve to promote improved mental health, uh, water filtration in the buildings to per, to you know promote healthy uh, lifestyle, reduce diseases and contamination, and then bike parking again to promote healthy and active lifestyle from a wellness perspective. You know some of these obviously have a lot of synergy with you know, different categories, but I think that's 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 the goal is to find those synergies between these different sort of KPIs where we can implement these into the building design. Um, in the next category, you know, we're focusing specifically on resources and embodied carbon and how can we reduce that footprint from that perspective, uh, looking at the reuse of structures to preserve the cultural heritage that already exist in the, in the Willowbrook community, uh, specifying low carbon materials uh, with you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, 
specifying durable materials and increasing the life cycle, um, you know, looking at materials that, you know, can have longevity, not just a 20 year life cycle, but a 50 year and plus uh, life cycle. Uh, looking at waste diversion, you know, really how can we have a zero waste uh, development, keeping uh, materials out of the landfills, uh, local materials, uh, things that are specific to, you know, uh, Southern California climates, things that are from local suppliers, local vendors, and then also local labor. So we can provide equity opportunities for small businesses and minority business enterprises to come in and work on these projects to have businesses set up in this development, uh, you know, to, you know, help them grow from a financial uh, perspective as well, too. And then from, you know, energy perspective, looking at, you know, in, uh, uh, operational carbon, you know, this is intended to be a net zero project. Uh, so looking at clean energy opportunities, both on site, you know, solar panels, as well as microgrids and other on site generation uh, technologies, heat pumps, you know, all electric, everything, every, no, no fossil fuels across the entire development, uh, battery storage for grid resiliency um, at, at, for a development this size, you know, it, it's important for the owner to have the ability to not be subject to brownouts and, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, storage capacity for time of use, uh, you know, uh, uh, billing and, and energy consumption. Uh, looking at air sealing opportunities for both energy reduction and cleaner indoor air quality. Uh, looking at using native planting for not only using less water, but looking at emissions reductions associated with, you know, uh, moving water across the state uh, to get to the site. Um, and then clean energy in general, uh, you know, resulting in lower utility cost and cost savings, which will hopefully free up act, uh, actual capital for the residents. So they're not spending as much money per month on you know, their utility bills that can go to maybe paying for childcare, maybe paying for healthier foods, maybe paying for all kinds of different things like that, or, and hopefully also increase savings as well too. And, and then, so the last category of KPIs is, is, is education. Um, the idea that, you know, education at multiple scales is going to be really critical to this development. This is a development that's envisioned to not only sort of serve its residents and, you know, people that work there, but again, sort of impact the community as a whole. So looking at this as an opportunity for green jobs, people who can come in and receive training and actually provide labor towards the project uh, for installing solar panels and you know, doing wastewater treatment systems and different things like that. Uh, upscale, upskilling for career advancement. You know, part of the program is a, a, a community center and job training center where people can come in and learn about different green technologies uh, to come in and hopefully carry that on to you know, wherever they wanna go in their career going forward. Um, I just mentioned as far as the energy section goes, but from a education perspective, understanding the lower cost of living in, in a building uh, that does not have fossil fuels, that has clean energy associated, that gives a resident a chance to accumulate generational wealth because hopefully, you know, uh, more of their money can go towards savings and people don't have to spend 70 and 80, 90 percent of their annual uh, income on housing and utility costs. Um, access to education, you know, people being able to go to school to receive training will open up new doors to different job opportunities that may be higher paying jobs than what they may currently be able to find in, in the local community. Uh, and the training to be able to compete in the world market. You know, we hope that, you know, this, this development in Willowbrook will, uh, you know, be a leader for the market as a whole. So people who are working on this project, people who are living in this project, you know, will have the opportunity to be the case study uh, for what other people want to emulate, you know, across the world going forward. And then certainly, uh, last but certainly not least, is, is more diversity from the perspective of representation within the built environment. You know, again, sort of looking at, you know, uh, changing some of the hiring uh, uh, policies and practices for the labor force for the, both construction phase and for long term operations to, you know, provide opportunities for more people to be involved in this project in a diverse way and have more representation, uh, all part of the sort of educational sort of toolkit of things that we want to see unfold in this project. And so, you know, again, this is kind of a, a, a case study, not quite a case study yet, it's more of a beta test, you know, this is still early on the process, but, you know, we think this kit of parts that we put together uh, and kind of, you know, we're calling it kind of the basis of design that the design team will be implementing as we go forward really kind of creates this vision for the project. Uh, it's choosing the pathway of decarbonization 
really, you know, not only reduces the environmental impacts, you know, reduces greenhouse gas emissions and reduces energy costs, operational costs, and all those sorts of things. But ultimately, we think the real power in this project is by providing an opportunity to empower the residents, empower the occupants for a cleaner, healthier, and safer space for people to live, work, and learn. And so, you know, I, I went to this idea of the triple bottom line, which I'm sure many of us, all of us are probably familiar, familiar with, which is people, planet, and profit. And, and I added one more to that, which is power. And I think if we think about not only how can we reduce our impacts on the planet, how, how can we save money? How can we be more supportive of people? Then we can go to the next level of doing more than just being less bad or being neutral, but talk about empowering people as we move forward. And so that's what I got. And I'm going to leave it there and open it up for any questions. That's an amazing project, Lance. That's awesome. Um, there were some questions that I wanted to convey so you could dig in. Um, Junius Pressy wondered, how effective is your approach to engaging the community towards community ownership? So the ownership, this, uh, let me see if I answer that a couple of different ways. So a couple of things, we have a community engagement element of our program, which is meeting with all the local community stakeholders, residents, businesses, everything. So that, the, it, it, the process is following that model. Now, as far as specifically a community ownership model, this particular project has a couple different backers. Uh, one of the backers I'm trying to, there's some parts of the project I can't exactly disclose all the details on just yet, because it's not 100% public, but one of the backers is a, is a civic institution. Uh, and then, then it's uh, three other private developers that are kind of doing something similar to what's called a P3 model uh, of, uh, of development. So it's a joint venture development. So there are essentially four owners in this project uh, already. Um, and, and then there will be certainly other, you know, thousand plus tenants and, you know, uh, uh, businesses and different people moving in. So we haven't yet broached the subject of community ownership, but definitely community engagement in the process. The, the civic owner, the institutional owner, is a is a long term Willowbrook uh, resident landowner that's been there for fifty plus years. So they they are part of the community and, and they are invested in the the long term growth in this community. Thank you. Um, I had asked the question of Will this community be more affluent than the surrounding community, or is there a strategy to avoid gentrification and racial segregation? Um, I, I'm not sure that I would use the word affluent, but we hope that this community will will elevate from the surrounding community. That is that is one thousand percent the intention that it does that. Um, it is one hundred percent open. It is not a closed campus. It is it is. It is meant to serve the public, all the medical facilities, educational, this is all the things are, are community serving. So they are all open to the public. Um, the, the adjacent site, which is already there, um, is, is a public medical facility. Um, so it is intended to be part of that. But the, the, the idea with this investment across these 12 acres is to hopefully encourage other uh, economic investment in the Willowbrook community as well too. There, we, we've worked on uh, three other sort of multifamily mixed use projects in the adjacent area already uh, in the past three or four years. Um, and so this is now the next one in line uh, with this one. So we hope that this is part of elevating the entire city as a whole, um, but not, not definitely not intended to be gentrification for sure. And is there an affordable housing component? Uh, the vast majority of it is affordable housing. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, so almost uh, basic, what's the percentage? Uh, I'll say roughly 50% of it is affordable housing. Okay, that, that gets a big job done. Um, we're about to transfer, but I had one last question, which is, is there an edible landscaping component? Um, not specifically yet, but that idea is on the table. We've talked about green roofs. We've talked about different types of, you know, uh, 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 gardening and, and community gardens where people can plant their own food and flowers. So that, that is in discussion. Again, this is kind of the kit of parts we're starting with. So nothing's necessarily off the table yet, uh, but, uh, but not specifically in the table, on the table yet. We are working with a landscape architect that's done a lot of really interesting work. So uh, we're trying to sort through all those different ideas to incorporate green space in lots of different forms and fashions throughout this project. Well, um, I'll just share that, that I 
in some of the affordable housing projects I've seen the landscape designers have actually chosen a subset of the property or a subset of the trees to be productive fruit trees like oranges or blank, you know, and, and it's, I, I just encourage it because it, it may, means free food, you know. Yeah, I, I think so, you know, healthy food, healthy choices and, and green space are a critical part of what we're doing out here. So I, I have a feeling that's gonna manifest itself somehow in the design for sure. It's beautiful. Um, so uh, you can head over to the chat. Thank you so much, Lance, that was awesome.